next we're going to bring up Stephen Bond. Where's Stephen? Did he already escape to the back? Come on up, Stephen. And Stephen's going to visit with us this morning about biodiversity and nutrition. Excellent. They're bringing me water, too. I hear a lot of other folks coughing. I don't know if it's allergies or what, but I'm a mess. Ugh, let me get that out of the way. <coughs> All right. Plus, I got a little choked up. Chikasha uh, seya, chakta seya, I'm Chickasaw chakta. And I'm, that slideshow kind of been, was wonderful and, um, you know, got me. <laughs> All right, so we got a clicker. Isn't that a dreadful image? That's kind of my um, perspective on biodiversity <laughs> right now. I've, so I'm a, I, have, I have a very diverse background. Um, so my, um, let's, let's, let's go back a generation. My mother grew up um, in Worcester, Oklahoma, in the Choctaw Nation, and she didn't have running water. I'm so <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> no more ch Chickasaw or Choctaws before my speak. No, <laughs> I think we need to be separated by one talk, maybe. Because uh, I've been on that mountain, and I've been all over those woods. And it's bad. It's, we've lost so much. Oh. Yeah, my, um, my great-grandparents in Worcester, they had a subsistence farm. And um, I didn't know my father. <laughs> okay, I'm going to skip that story altogether. <laughs> this could turn out bad. Anyways, um, that was the most... Uh, I'll, I'm going to bully through a bit of that. Um, it was the most spiritual place for me going and hunting the, the squirrels and, the, you know, running through the woods. And, and um, okay, when I came back is after college, they, had, they clear cut it and put uh, chicken facilities there. Okay. <laughs> the end. Next. <laughs> okay, so it's, we've, um, we've always been pretty violent and hungry, a hungry species and our um, ecological resources has, has been a, a work in progress since the beginning. Um, so this is the um, Homo sapiens killing uh, uh, micro or macrofauna. Um, what are they? There's a um, a term for it. It's um, charismatic macrofauna. So the so the woolly mammoth um, who fed on uh, our um, Bodark uh, fruits, if y'all have ever wondered who the heck ate those things, if y'all know Bodark, horse apple, um, that's what we make our bows from, and, and um, it happens to be right there in Oklahoma. Those, these giant fruits, they roll down now and rot, and they still spread, and there's a lot in, in, um, in the hedgerows up here. But, um, so we, um, we, we eventually settled down. The microfauna, uh, you know, were wiped out. Um, and then we started working on the, uh, or macrofauna, we started working on the microfauna and, and um, cultivating crops. And it, agriculture's not, uh, you know, a, a good, it's, it's rarely um, a good practice within the in, in environmental regime. We can, it's not sustainable. Um, if we're, by modern standards, if we're talking about, um, water quality, all these things. We can do things to minimize our impact, but, you know, so there's, so from the very beginning, we started altering the, the, the environment to, to our benefit, um, and that allowed us the capacity to start specializing in other techniques and processes, and, and, um, and we, we developed guns and germs and still, if y'all have ever read um, that book, and, and um, ships and huge populations and and it, it continued to um, continue to grow. Um, this, let, let me um, say on, on all these images, this, this is not my research per se. I was trying to kind of maybe provide some insight or a context of environment within nutrition. Um, so the, I didn't cite any of these images. Some of them are really unclear, but I did pull um, a lot of the, the maps and imagery from um, peer-reviewed sites, or, you know, these are legitimate, uh, this is legitimate data. Um, so we had all types of food all around, and the end result of an environment often um, 
you know, suffers. So, so we've, we've been in conflict with nature um, from the beginning, both Ameri you know, American Indians and Europeans and Chinese or, or whatever. Um, when you clear cut or burn out and, uh, an area and plant another crop that you know, otherwise didn't belong there, it's, there's going to be some impact. Um, now, all these processes didn't, um, weren't, weren't like today, where we continued to, to, um, to grow in areas. The Chickasaws and Choctaws, we would have had um, old fields. So we would come back to our village sites would move every 20 to 30 years, and we didn't always cultivate in the same area. And uh, we were a large ag agrarian society. So, um, sorry, I usually use my laptop, and this next, the next slide prompts me to, um, to talk if I have pauses. I'm trying to think of what's coming up next. Um, so the, we all know that this all happened relatively um, quick. So if, if, we, if we go from that woolly mammoth shot um, to that um, black powder shot, <laughs> so we're going from an addle addle um, walking, hunting, and, and, and cruise to uh, uh, diesel, uh, steam, gunpowder, chemistry uh, approach. Um, and we had a, a whole nother series of extinction events um, here in, in North America when the Europeans come on. Um, the, we had been living in, to some degree, in harmony with some of this some of these species. So this is the dodo. I put it up because it's the quintessential um, creature that you know talks about ex extinction species. Almost everybody heard about this in school. Um, the the tribes were able to to live and coexist with a lot of these species. There are some examples of like the deer deer trade where we extirpated um, the deer species so we could get guns, so we could defend our territory from the influx of Spaniards and French and, and English, um, uh, Canadians, and you know whatever else was going on at the time. Um, extirpate means when something's gone from your area um, but still exists elsewhere. So we, we, we have a lot of extra, extirpated species. So, um, so this is just uh, mass slaughter of dodos. It was much like the turkeys that was um, that was mentioned. The these many of these animals, uh, when you when you read about them in the the, the original European works, um, they they weren't afraid of, of humans. Like you could, we hunted turkeys with sticks, so you could literally lob a, a stick, and almost every Chickasaw Choctaw kid kind of heard about the squirrel sticks, and so that's a uh, I forget the traditional name for them, but it's just a stick. And um, there's a really good book that talks about Oklahoma. Um, as the tribes were getting here, um, see, it's, um, I always forget the author. Um, he wrote Ichabob Crane. Um, does anybody know? <laughs> Washington Irving, there we are. And there's a little museum outside of Stillwater where I had kind of turned on to this, um, got turned on to this story. but. Um, he wrote about uh, the the European honeybees um, being here before before the influx of Europeans. Um, he wrote about the abundancy of the game because those hunting parties would have been you know 60, 70 guys all carrying black powder rifles and and he wrote about the the environmental state of Oklahoma. Um, there's some real um, interesting environmental facts about Oklahoma that, that allows us to, to gain some insight into what the tribes were doing, and it doesn't look anything like it does now. Nothing looks anything like it, like, nothing looks anything um, like, it, like it did. So we've seen mass clear-cut, um, um, filled in the wetlands, we've channelized the streams, and our homelands um, aren't, aren't what they were. I, and it's, it's more humid than Oklahoma, so I assume they keep it. <laughs> Um, pass, passenger pigeons um, were, were another one that was um, totally annihilated. I think it's a passenger pigeon, maybe another, another, um, another species, but um, this is all that remains, you know, in some stuffy basement of some university of, of that species. Um, it's not all negative, so I had to promise Mindy I wouldn't get up here and talk about the, the, how, how terrible it is and utter destruction. We've brought some species back. 
uh, from the brink of extinction. And we have others that are at the edge of, of, of extinction um, that, we're, um, that we're working with to make sure that doesn't happen. And we see them in the news. They're often the panda bear types. And there's a lot of things that are, that are endangered that, that are off most folks' radar. Um, this is the uh, American chestnut tree. There's some unusual species that were very culturally significant. So this would have made up a, a bulk percentage of, of our wild harvest um, uh, nut crop in, in Chickasaw, uh, Choctaw, and a lot of the southeastern tribes. Um, when the Europeans had came over, they brought their own chestnuts, and with them brought uh, chestnut blight. And so this completely annihilated that um, that species, um, the unusual thing is that it still grows from suckers, and so there's still old trees that, ha that are suckering, but when they get, and they may even grow to 10, 20 foot tall, but when they get too large, then they get the blight and die. And um, so horticulturalists have found some of the northern extents of some of these populations, another one's American elm, and, um, and have grafted and selected and, and developed, and maybe have done some breeding and brought these things back. Um, so you can actually buy uh, grafted uh, chestnut, American chestnuts that are um, um, blight resistant. And there's a lot of things that we've lost in the, um, in, you know, this wasn't all at the, at the beginning uh, of, of our uh, encounters with the, with the Europeans. There's been a lot of things that have been lost. Um, a lot of things that we would have eaten so that's the, the tie into nutrition, so that um, as, um, as our, our options were limited, and you'll see additional slides about you know, the amount of land that's put to commercial agriculture and clear-cut forest, and these things all have affected our, our um, food options. So we'll just go through that. Um, so what we're left with now is, um, is the, the knowledge of the, the destructive capacity of our species, um, d despite culture or uh, creed. And that's what we're, um, that's what we're gonna, you know, we, we gotta start, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta go somewhere. Um, believe it or not, the environment in the United States may not be as bad as it was in the 70s and 60s when the, the rivers were on fire and all that mercury found its way into all our lakes in Oklahoma and elsewhere and, and, um, and we were having um, loss of species that we weren't aware of because there wasn't as much knowledge base. Um, I actually discovered a, a new genus of mayfly, a Femiopteran, um, in western Oklahoma uh, with, with Dr. Grant at um, Southwest Oklahoma State, and so there's, there's still genetic work to be done. We, did, we didn't eat um, mayflies, but fish did, so that, that's kind of relevant. And, um, so we, we have a, uh, we're, you know, most of us in here are probably from North America, so I, I was gonna talk about South America, and that it really gets exciting talking about biodiversity in South America and, and a lot of the things that are still going on down there. That's been a tough nut to crack for the Europeans, so there's still some pockets of, of really good uh, biodiversity. They haven't clear cut and, and um, plow, plowed it through. Um, so um, I've got the Oklahoma biodiversity hotspots, and, and this is from the Nature Conservancy, and they're a, a leader in biodiversity, and I'd never seen this image until I pulled it up for this presentation. It's, um, you, can, you can really see um, if we go back to, the, to the, the larger global biodiversity look in the U.S., we do have some really significant spots of biodiversity, and they're often associated. These aren't mountains um, necessarily, but the, um, like individual mountain ranges. Like Oklahoma doesn't really have a mountain, but, but it has a, um, a biodiversity island, and so it does have a higher elevation and as you increase in elevation, you have uh, um, less humans mucking about and um, more, you know, increased uh, biodiversity. So these do rep represent elevations, and in, you know, a lot of cases, they are mountains. Um, and that's a, those are biological hotspots. Um, this is broken out um, so we can study it better in the sciences by ecological regions and these larger levels down to smaller levels. And when you get down to within the eco-regions, y'all will recognize some of the, um, the terminology. So I, I, um, 
I bold, emboldened the, the, uh, the eco, level three ecosystems that I've personally visited and are familiar with, which I was really surprised how many, but um, there's some I've you know, never been anywhere near. Um, let's see, where, where are we on this? We're on the next one in Oklahoma. So we're, we're in the plains, we're, we're right at the cusp of the transition from the, the eastern deciduous forests and the Great Plains. I actually live right at the, at the, the cusp of some large ecoregions and some small ecoregions. It's what they call the cross timbers. So it's, it's known to be dominated by two species of oak with intermittent um, grass um, areas, and it's highly diverse. We have the species from the east, the species from the west, an endemic or indigenous species um, that only occur in Oklahoma. And um, like the previous speaker I uh, mentioned, uh, we've got, um, it's very similar to our homelands. So we would have found um, our, our Bashanchik, you know, it's a sumac. Sumac's pretty ubiquitous um, through, through most of the southeastern part of the United States. And, in some of the south, um, uh, western parts of the state, and it's a very important plant for us because it was a, uh, a readily uh, available supply of vitamin C. If y'all have ever taken sumac berries and put them in your Nalgene and shook it up, it's like lemonade, it's lovely, and you can just kinda suck on the berries when you're out hiking, but there's always bugs on them. I don't care about the bugs. Um, I just throw them in. And, um, the, and if you've ever, how many of us have eaten hummus? You don't have to do a show, show of hands. Y'all have seen the red dust on the top? It's sumac. <laughs> sumac isn't going to kill you, and it's not poisonous. It's related to poison ivy, uh, which we call enfant and tinge. Um, and we would actually eat the berries and the leaves to um, evoke a, a resistance to poison ivy. I don't recommend doing that unless you're with a friend that's done it before. You need to use mouthwash and wash your face and hands afterwards. But... So hopefully, I, I put all these on because I hope that it would, um, that some of y'all would recognize some of the words um, in your, your local um, names of things and various regions. And um, obviously you can't read any of this um, madness even on a PDF on your laptop, but I, I think the original one must be like this big. But this is the, these are the eco-regions, and this is how scientists um, can, can hone in on region-wide um, practices to, to save biodiversity. So level two, we get more uh, uh, clarity. And level three, we get uh, even more clarity. And so it gets broken out into uh, ecoregions. And these are often associated with soil types and precipitation gradients and um, elevation and you know all those variables that scientists love to um, collect data on. So I've got a, um, there, biodiversity is threatened on all fronts. Um, personal preference, um, culture, um, the, the climate change, global weirding, and I like to call it weirding. Not every place is going to get warm. Um, and so I've, I've done a, a series of these global biodiversities with a few uh, maps so we can do kind of an overlay to look at a complicated thing. Um, the biodiversity hotspots overlain with the uh, uh, major city development, uh, clear cut, urban sprawl, uh, over harvesting, environmental contaminants, um, how we influence, if we take water from a stream, there's not water to have the natural undulations to provide habitat for insects that feed um, fish that feed bears, et cetera, et cetera. And so the, the whole web is, is, is threatened. The predator species were the first to go. So we've got a lot of um, attacks. So here's that other one. So kind of put that in your, in your periphery and, and look at global cropland. So you can imagine, y'all have seen cropland, right? There's not much diversity on cropland. It's flat. We're using a lot of resources. We're putting in pollution. There's, it's not pretty. It's not pretty, but we got to do it, right? We got to eat. There's because we saw that other slide. There's a lot of us. There's a lot more of us. And um, one of the elders said, "I was was having this conversation, and he said, um, as, as long as breeding's more fun than dying, there'll be more people.' I'm like, okay, <laughs> sure. <laughs> and if we have more time, I'd tell you another story, but the." 
it was a Korean story, and he was talking about um, a, a traditional product or a traditional um, dish that we had and, uh, called tant flan. And um, he kept referencing a dog that was hung from a tree and beaten to death. And his, and his wife was like, no, was, that was in Korea. <laughs> and, uh, okay, so uh, global rangeland and pasture. So what we haven't cropped, we got the black cows on. So the, there's not a lot of, I mean, what do, so scientists, botanists, uh, rangeland management folk um, call the species that occur in grass, outside of grass, ice cream species, because that's what the cows eat first. <laughs> so so um, ironically, as an as a ethnobotanist, as a trained botanist, um, I see more biodiversity in the roadways than in most of our national parks, our forested areas. It's madness, really. That's where I do a lot of my collecting for um, imagery and to discuss the, uh, for my, for my uh, writing projects is on, along a roadside. It may be a country road, it may be along a highway, but there's something, um, the, you know, they mow the roadsides in Oklahoma um, and in the southeast because things just grow. It's kind of like a, we're a little more precipitation and we'd be rainforest, but, um, but the, we don't have uh, targeted selection of those ice cream species and roadsides. Now, I don't recommend harvesting, wild harvesting and roadsides because you're going to have environmental contaminants. And so you really need to go deep into the woods to be, you know, to be safe to get away from all that. Um, I'll also mention, before, because I'll forget, um, most of our traditionally important species that were used for food and medicine outside of the cultivated crops were wetland and riparian species. And they were hyper-accumulators of heavy metals. And, and they still are. <laughs> and so FYI, just, you know, if you're a wild harvester, um, you may have a conversation with your tribal environmental office about it. And they would often be very excited to do some sampling to determine if there's heavy metals in those, those crops. Um, so we got the we got cows and tractors and greedy humans and air pollution and all these other things and invasive species. So the, a lot of the species that, that came over with the Europeans um, just, just spread like wildfire because it was just a, 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 a nutrient-rich environment. Uh, if, we look at the <clears throat> if we look at the European soils, they've been continually cropped, um, westernized approach for so many years that the, they've that they had, um, you know, pulled away a lot of that, 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 that um, the native plant pressure, their weed, they didn't have as many weeds. Um, the, the, the nutrients uh, weren't as available, and maybe these were super weeds when they came over on the Mayflower or whatever. Um, we brought over, um, um, as folks went from one side to the other side of the country, the, the seeds of these weeds were called boot cuff species because the seeds would actually be in the boots, you know, of the of the of the pioneers. You know, they came on the wagon, they came in the hay that they were bringing with the cattle or the hogs, the feed, and so they were equally distributed. These are really good for gardens, really terrible for biodiversity, especially in this neck of the woods as we go into the East Coast. How many of us ever thought about the nefarious nature of an earthworm? <laughs> it's, so how in the heck did earthworms get over here? They were probably brought over in little styrofoam dishes with like a plastic cup, right? Or plastic lid? <laughs> no, they were, um, they were used in the bowels of the ships that were brought over here with, um, weighted with soil. The soil was emptied so you could load it with trade goods and slaves. So this soil was dumped onto our ground and they brought their mycorrhizal fungi and their virals, uh, viruses and bacterias and earthworms. And what an earthworm does is they degradate the organic layer in a hardwood forest and they minimize habitat. So it's a wreck on biodiversity. Because um, these are a lot of niche species. Principally plants are affected by this, like a maybe some kind of um, Spiranthes orchid or something that you'd only find in this particular part of a beechwood forest. Kudzu, that have, I'm sure a lot of us have heard this. It's absolutely beautiful. 
and whimsical at a distance if you don't own the land and live far away from the state that it's in. Uh, we have it in Oklahoma, but I, I don't think people even know that. I, I've seen it. Um, it's an edible species in Japan. It's well behaved. Um, it was gifted actually to DC as a landscaping element along with the, the cherry trees um, by the Japanese federal government, or it was a ploy for, for revenge. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, there are some species that have uh, recently come on the news, and so I thought it'd be fun to put in this. This is a full-size deer, which is just blows my mind. Um, it, these are the key deers, and so this is uh, the slide that was supposed to key me to talk about uh, global weirding and, and some of the things. How are we on time? Oh, are we there? All right, brilliant. Um, the these things are only alive because humans are kind of managing them. Um, this gal is spraying a flesh-eating uh, bacterial, anti-flesh-eating bacterial spray on this deer so it doesn't die from the, you know, the polluted waters that come on. I bet when there was hurricanes before, it wasn't polluted water. It was just water. Now it's polluted water. Um, okay, and so this is a positive, upbeat slide since we're at that five-minute mark. Um, we have a wonderful diversity of cultivated plants that are also um, in danger. I've been working with ancestral seeds um, nearly my whole life. I've, I remember uh, running my first tractor through a barbed wire fence and halfway down a pasture um, because I, didn't, I got off of it and it didn't have the safety mechanisms and it kept going and dad was, uh, anyways, I, I was probably this big, <laughs> this old. Um, we, I've, I've had a rare uh, opportunity to, to, to grow up in those families, that subsistence farm that I mentioned that I won't go into detail about ever again. Um, we grew a bunch of stuff and, and harvested it. It was old McDonald. I mean, there was geese and hogs and cattle and all sorts of small-scale heritage crops before it was hit. I didn't realize how hit my great-grandparents were. And, um, and we have a lot of abundancy. Um, we're going to have to do some genetic work. Uh, we need to support our environmental uh, groups. We need to um, become educated above and beyond um, the minimal standard because it's our responsibility to take care of the environment. The end. <laughs>